Curiosity Stream. This is Star Talk, and I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today, this is a Star Talk devoted to the first man. Adam? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> That was Chuck Nice, my co-host <laughs> of The First Man, Sorry. special edition of Star Talk. We're, of course, talking about Neil Armstrong and his first steps on the moon. And we're not going to do that unless we bring in an astronaut. Wow. I mean, and a cool, I, I got, on my roller decks, I got some astronauts. Wow. And one of my favorites, actually, he is my favorite, but I don't want to tell you. Oh, him. that's <laughs> nice. That's, thank Mike you. Massimino. Mike. Neil. Dude, thanks for coming. Chuck, thanks for having me. I'm so glad I could uh, This was on short today. notice. We saw each yeah. other just the other night. Yeah. Uh, both, we saw a preview screening of the film First Man, all about Neil Armstrong. And I realized it's not about Neil Armstrong. It is Neil Armstrong's view. Yeah. Right? It's his P the point of view of it's the who whole. who he thing. was. It's yeah. Who, who he was. They captured cool. uh, his, his personality, what he was about, the way he approached his work. Yeah, it was. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. Well, let me finish introducing you. So, you're a former NASA astronaut. Yes. You're a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. You're a professor at Columbia University, and you're a senior space advisor to the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum. Thank you for mentioning all those things. And yes, your 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 wife and dad. I mean, your husband and dad. Yes, yes, correct. The wife that the operation is later. So you'll yeah. <laughs> His wife on Tuesdays. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, uh, no, but just thanks for making time for coming in for this. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. Yeah. Always good to see you guys, especially with to talk about my boyhood hero, Neil nice. Armstrong. So I, did you guys know Neil Armstrong? Can I finish introducing <laughs> Oh, you're still thing? on this introduction? I'm sorry. Holy moly. You're a veteran of two space flights. <laughs> uh, STS, which is NASA code for space trans... Transportation system. Correct. Oh, cool. It, Got it. it actually makes sense. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's called a shuttle. Shuttle. <laughs> shuttle mission 109. Yeah, yeah. And in 2002 and 125, that was a good one, mm -hmm. in May 2009, the last servicing mission of the Hubble telescope, giving it life into the 2010s. That's right. And you had four spacewalks. Yep. And you're the, f okay. Uh, he's the yep. first man unto himself. Yes, he is. The first man to... Tweet from space. Oh! Nice. Yeah. Take, take that, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. Neil Armstrong said, one small step for man, one yeah. giant leap for mankind. What were your first tweet from space? Yeah, that's the problem. There's Now, there's a Neil Armstrong <laughs> story here related to it. Okay. I don't know if we want go, to go, go there go, yet. Go, go, go. The very first time, Neil Armstrong came the first, to speak to my astronaut class. We were there for a total of four days. So you're on, still like an astronaut cadet where, no, or Yeah, we were just getting like, he was total there for newbies. His, he happened to be in town for his physical. Our training manager reached out to him. In Houston, right, at the Johnson Space Center, all new astronauts. And, and she asked him, or uh, Paige Molesby was her name, she asked, she went and gave get a message over to the clinic, would he come speak to us? And he said he would, but he only wanted to speak to the new astronauts. So he came over and talked to us mainly about uh, flying in the X-15, and we asked some questions. The X-15, the, 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 the yep. test uh, plane from NASA, yeah. based on a military... Uh, I mean, it's a it's a it's, it's a rocket a plane. super it it's a rocket amazing. plane supersonic yeah. rocket and, plane yeah and it's it was one of the more it's I don't know, maybe the most successful experimental aircraft ever ever built it they went like Mach seven a couple of those guys seven times first, the speed of sound yeah and a couple of those guys earned their astronaut wings for having for done altitude so. yeah that's how high this airplane could go it could get mm -hmm. you to what I know space is an arbitrary boundary that's another th story right. but uh, but they were able to earn astronaut wings in that Earth in that itself aircraft. is in space. Yes, it, yes. It's a, <laughs> have you ever been to whole, space? That's another yes, I'm I, on I, Earth. I, I hate to bring this up because then you'll, we'll have a whole other show going here right, right, right. about the boundary of space. But but an amazing air aircraft. He talked about that and other things, and we got to meet him and talk to him. But the day after, we were at a um, – it was like a luncheon going on because it was a reunion as well as him coming in for his physical. And I ended up next to him on the food line. You know, making a sandwich. Damn, and even like, Neil Armstrong had to go on a chow line. He wow, had, he has man, to that, that's cold. That doesn't even seem right. That's that's not that's wrong. You know and what it mean? wasn't it wasn't bad food though, even though it was government food. It wasn't anyway. So he's next to me. I you know it's, I'm, I had I said to myself, I, I, I had to say something to this guy because I'm next to him. I don't know how it happened, but serendipitously, and I asked him, "When did you think of that first thing that you said on the moon? The one small step for man." I go, did you know, did your wife tell you? Did you get a publicist? Did, who, how'd you come up with this? And he turned to me and he says, well, Mike, I thought about it only after we landed. Because if we didn't land, 
I wouldn't have to say anything. It wouldn't make a difference. And so I concentrated only on the landing. Saved his think, brain energy. Well, he, yeah. but I think what he was, the message he was trying to get to me as a new astronaut, um, or I don't know if he was trying, but the message I took was, you take care of business first, and you worry about that worry about other that. stuff later. Right. So his, his focus was landing on the moon. So for my tweet... I did the same approach. I said, I'm not going to worry about this first tweet. We have to <laughs> we have to launch into space. We have to get there alive and successfully. I got, a, I got a job yeah. to do. No, Big this, mistake. This sounds like right. a mistake. This was a mistake. Sorry. So I get there and it's, all right, we're alive and it's time to, this computers are up and running on day one. And so I need to come up with something. So what I, what I said, what I tweeted was, launch was awesome. The adventure of a lifetime has begun. I'm feeling great, enjoying the view. Something like long, but the first, okay. the first, it was okay. But during the during the mission, um, I, 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 you know, I was paying attention to the mission. Of course, mm -hmm. during the mission, aside a sidebars, I didn't get any email from my kids. My kids were they were both teenagers. You mentioned I'm a father. Yes, I love my kids. They were both in I high love school. My kids, but but they were very happy that I was <laughs> yeah. away from the planet. <laughs> At that time, and they yeah. were ignoring me, and I'm writing them. You know, well, they could they, they could have taken it personally. Some well, dads go on a business trip. No, no, no. They, they, you they, left planet Earth. They were happy I was away, <laughs> okay. and they were like, "Dad, annoying dad can't bother us anymore." And I wasn't getting Where's any dad, email. Is he in New from York him. or is he in space? Which right. way did they, he go? Well, they knew I wasn't there, and they okay. were just happy enough they didn't want to be reminded. So I wasn't getting an email from him. Saturday comes. Saturday comes and Saturday Night Live makes fun of this tweet, Neil. And this was in '09, so it's the 40th anniversary of the. Of the of the almost a fourth anniversary of uh, of Apollo Eleven, and uh, Seth Meyers on SNL says we have the first tweet from space, Mike Massimino, uh, and here it is: launch was awesome. In forty years, we've gone from one giant leap for mankind <laughs> to, to launch, launch was, was awesome. awesome. <laughs> if we ever find life in the universe, I assume this is how we'll be notified. <laughs> and it shows my little Twitter thing, and it says, "Geez, dudes, aliens." <laughs> So wow. they made fun of me, and my kids finally sent my email on that Monday. Uh, they sent me email on that Monday, and I was you know, after the space walks were over, like, Dad, I thought, thanks for saving the Hubble. You did great. No. I was, Dad, they made fun of you on Saturday Night Live. All the kids at school loved it. Keep saying stupid stuff. <laughs> so I don't think Neil Armstrong ever got a reaction like that from his kids on that. What he said. So, so that, that was, was the first that tweet. That was bad advice for you. Uh, no, it was still good advice. I still think it's good advice because yeah. his advice was you take care of business first and that's what you concentrate on. And I think that's the way that way, and, the way he was. And I think that's why he was chosen to be the first man. If only he had not. followed it up with and make sure you schedule your tweets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, also uh, this story and others we can find in your book, Space Man. Yes. Space Man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, plug. Of course. Not, Thanks, man. That's a plug. It's a yes. It is a plug. But it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an authentically you. I, conceived. I, I, uh, you're a great storyteller, yeah. and I love the book. Thank you. And you didn't fix the cover photo though, because you're sitting there smiling. Oh, yeah, I know. And there's a rocket coming out of yeah. your ear that's launched behind well, you. Well, I was told the publisher's in charge of the. You can have input for the cover, but they. I could, I was in charge of the words. And it looked like you had ear racks with a plane. I know. Coming I've out heard. And I, in fact, if you see the, I've heard other comments which we can't mention <laughs> about what that looks like. So yes, I agree. Um, so the two of us saw a pre-screening of First Man, and uh, everything I know about Neil Armstrong, because I knew him, I mean, I don't claim I knew him well, we weren't beer drinking buddies, but I mean, we were acquaintances, I should say, mm -hmm. and everything I knew about him, and I think is true for you, all that you knew about him, all that you knew of him, was consistent with how he was portrayed in this film, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, wow. everything that I knew about him. So give me my, your best absolutely. characterization of him, because some people don't even know that. I, 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 would, I would say that um, he, loved, he loved flying airplanes. He loved doing his job. He loved being a test he pilot. He was a fighter, test pi he was a fighter a pilot, pilot, pilot first. In Korea. Yep. Then test pilot. Yes. Then a test pilot. And he was, he was I guess, a, a, a very thoughtful engineer, but loved flying. Uh, uh, when he came and spoke to our astronaut class, oh, we he's got that engineer mm. club. He's well, in. he was a, he, yeah. but he saw, he saw it as an engineering problem, as a challenge. And that's why I think he was not just a great pilot because he loved flying, but also a great test pilot because he enjoyed the engineering behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that was pretty impressive, I that's thought. An, I had never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. could be fly boy, say, give me that machine, I'll do what I get. Yeah. But if you're an engineer, you're thinking about the machine. Right. And if, the aerodynamics, yes. the, and everything. if you're really into that, like he was, uh, I think it was, it was this, 
and, and not all great engineers, I think, can make great pilots, but he was one of those that could. And I think that's why you have a really special test pilot. And do they He's ever a- make a change to the uh, plane? And uh, or uh, and he says, no, that ain't <laughs> that ain't going to work. I'm sure he <laughs> chimed in. I would I would I would expect that those conversations were made, and especially back in those days when they were doing things that were much different. Uh, than what they had ever done before and how fast they were going, how high they were going, what they were trying to achieve. Okay. When his pe- the test pilot days, uh, uh, there was, I'm sure there was a lot of those conversations, yeah. So uh, I would add to that that mm-hmm. Neil Armstrong was was not gregarious. He was a very right. quiet man, yeah. did not seek publicity, yep. did not, you know, he's not the person who'd say is the life of the party. Yep. But sometimes the people who are not the life of the party are sitting there doing nothing. He's sitting there, in his head, mm-hmm. figuring stuff out. It's the active, restless brain of the engineer. Yep. And so th- this was surely captured. That was him. And when I first met him, Neil, you, you, you described that really well. Uh, when he got up there in front of our, we all stood up and gave him a standing ovation. And, and just about all, I was one of the younger per- people in that group of new astronauts in 96. So just about everyone in that room, maybe one or two wouldn't remember remembered where they were and he that uh, he and that episode of of what he did landing on the moon that whole mission inspired most of us to become astronauts i would say we all remembered it and so you're meeting your hero we're meeting our hero and it was just me it was everybody and he was he's the man right he was he was the man and he gets up there and was it seemed almost like he was painfully shy almost that it was hard for him wow. to talk and he he didn't mention the moon at all he talked about test flying and how important that is and how you have to be diligent about it and, and how much he loved doing that. And after he was done, when we got the questions and answers, then we started asking what was it like on the moon. Mm-hmm. But up to that point, he was delivering that message. Yeah, almost painfully shy, but he you, was so he loved so, so much what he did and it felt it was so important that that's what he focused on. He was the right man for the job. Do you think NASA chose him to be the first on the moon because of all of this because he does not seek publicity because because if they got some grandstand in yeah mm-hmm. yo look at me i'm right. on the moon yep. here's my book about me being on the moon here's my talk show interview i've got yeah. a need for speed <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you mean yeah. like if it was one of us <laughs> is that what you're basically saying no. yeah no, no. Uh, um do you think yeah they thought that through I, I think that uh, what they needed they, someone humble. You know, I, I, that I, I, that seems like a. You know, I, I used to think that, and maybe at first, but I think lately in the last few years, I've changed my 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 thinking of it, because I think that's almost too much thinking. I think really what they wanted to do. No, really, you know, I think what they were looking for was the I guy think that would that get was that too much thinking. No, because you, you start. You, I, I guess you, you start. It. You start thinking too many things. Like, oh, this guy has wearing blue, and this guy, you know, you overthink it. I think what they what they saw was. This was the right man to, to, to land on the moon. Whether or not he was gregarious, whether or not he was shy, whether or not, whatever those personality traits veins. were, mm. he was the right man because he understood what was happening. He was going to focus on that job 100%, not be distracted. And maybe that has partly to do with this, the fame seeking. But I think really he was chosen not for that, for the personality part of it but because he was the right man to do that so job. So did they choose who actually got out of the capsule first? Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, that's the whole so thing. It, it, but he was the mission lead as well. The mission commander. Was yes. He was the so, commander, that's and right. So, um, it, it wasn't because he was commander that he got to go first. They actually made the choice like, you're going to be the first to step foot on the moon. And your commander. And your commander. Like, yeah. those are two separate things. You think? Yeah. And so, like, for example, in it could have sh- been like in Star Trek. Yep. You go check out the glowing blob first. Right. <laughs> Buzz, you check, see that glowing thing? <laughs> Report back to me. Right. <laughs> and then I'll step off the. Right. Off the and that's true. You're going to be the black ensign from the Enterprise. <laughs> but that's the way, that's the way we did it. Now that you're saying it, I, that's why I spacewalked, apparently, because that's what we would do in the shuttle program, the commander and the pilot. Would not go out and spacewalk. The mission specialist would, and the underlying one of the underlying. Just to be clear, was, mission specialist is someone who has an expertise, usually a scientific or an engineering expertise, brought into the service of the mission. Correct. So you're not flying the plane. No, we're not there the for bird. landing. You're, you're, we're landing. not going to land. I mean, we're, we're part of landing, but we're not actually going to land. Right. Because the yeah. idea is 
what happens if your commander goes out and doesn't come back? Who's going to land? Right. Uh, but it's, it's okay if you go out and don't come back. You can still land the bird. I hate land to put it that way, but yes. <laughs> I'll put it like, that way. You don't have to put it, I'll put it that used, way. When we used to brief our spacewalks, Neil, there was, there was a lost crewman. There was a line, everything you would check, like, all right, this is in place, you know, this check, that check, that check. And part of the briefing was lost crewman. And lost crewman was a procedure we had to go rescue a guy that comes lost. And what we would do, sort of kidding around, was lost crewman, don't worry about it. We got three more. <laughs> That's what we did because we had four spacewalkers. So that was like the joke, and we'd all laugh. But on the line, like, hey, you know, you're kidding. You can come get me. But they, we were going to do that if we needed. Um, <laughs> what, what were we talking about? I don't oh, with the commander who went out yeah, first. The commander. And traditionally, I think in, in Gemini, what they did was is that the commander would Gemini, not go outside. Two, two astronaut capsule. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's when they first spacewalked. Ed White was the first spacewalker. And, and and Buzz was one of the one of the last spacewalkers in Gemini, but I think it was traditionally Buzz the commander stayed inside. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, mainly the command. I think the tradition was the commander stayed inside, and it was the pilot who went out mm-hmm. and then came back because the only one guy at a time going. So this was a different case where you're going to have both people going out for the for the for the walk. Wow. Yeah. Part of the authenticity of the film was there are little details that they didn't have to really care about, but they did. Yes. So there's a moment, I ha- I happen to own an Omega watch that was gifted to me by Stephen Hawking. Wow. And that's pretty nice. I, yeah. I, I don't mean to name drop. I was going to say, yeah. I just like the fact that you didn't name drop. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one too, but I had to buy it myself. Yeah. Right. No. So it was, no I have a Stephen Hawking watch too. He just doesn't know I have it. <laughs> well, you got his watch. Yeah, he was just <laughs> walking around just like, you got to see my watch. Who has seen my watch? <laughs> so. <laughs> it was gifted to, to you by you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Uh, no, I got the Stephen Hawking Award for science communication, and just the, so it's only like a year old. But but this cool, man. this introduced me to Omega watches. And yeah. Omega was the first watch on the moon. Right, for the, they were chosen by NASA after NASA got all the all the premier what the Rolex, yep. uh, Breitling, whatever, 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 yep. the, whatever the top watches were of the day. I I wonder if they threw in a Timex. I don't know, just to. Just to get America in there, I mm-hmm. bet so they. I'm yeah, sure, I'm they, sure did. they did. Okay, so they throw and it it's in. Probably yeah. still on the moon, taking a licking and keeping on ticking. <laughs> Nobody remembers that advertisement. It was a wind up. <laughs> Wait, no. So, <laughs> in fact, the yeah, the moon watch was a wind up. Wait, but go ahead. Yeah. So they put them all in black boxes each and scrambled them and then shake them, baked them, heated them, yeah. radiated them. And at the end of the experiments, the Omega still had the correct time. Wow. So Omega is our watch. And so yeah. they still milk that today with their advertising. Yeah. But in any event, in this festival that I attended, the Starmus Festival that Hawking is an organizer of, uh, uh, Omega was one of the sponsors. Mm-hmm. And so this became the watch. Yeah. It's, it's, engra- uh, it's engraved on the back. Yeah. But I saw... a. I watched it look very much like this on Neil Armstrong's hands it's right in here, the man. movie. It's right there. I'm yeah. wearing it. You're yeah. wearing it. You're wearing that watch. Yeah, I have. Show the yeah. camera. Now, and, no, did you, camera and did you, you, you get this from, from being an astronaut? No, no. This Okay, so we had uh, we had Omega watches on the shuttle, and the way it was explained to us, like how they won that competition was the crystal. Uh, apparently, that crystal that they had on top was almost impenetrable, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. you could do whatever you wanted to it. It wasn't going to crack, right. so particles are a problem. So that's why I and think And with moon gloves, how do you wind the watch? Well, I, I think you have to do <laughs> wind it ahead of time. Okay. Well, we had we had a different omega that we had we had a different we wind it ahead of time. We had a different omega uh for the shuttle. This is the moon version. I had a different one that I had to purchase. Now Omega was willing, I think, to give us these watches for free, but it was a government program and NASA said not so fast. Not allowed, yeah. So we had a we had to buy our watches, but we were able to purchase them from Omega and then fly them. I'm not wearing my my shuttle watch. And I'm wearing a moon watch that, yes, I had to go into the Omega store and buy. Man, that is messed up, man. No, it's okay. No, no, you okay. can't. No, otherwise, you can be it's bought. It's the right, yeah. It, it's the right it's thing. It's the right thing to That's do. That's how you want it yeah. to be. You don't want yeah, it any no, other no, way. No, no, it's the right thing. We got to take a break. Yeah. Okay. We got to take a break. All right. You are listening to, possibly even watching Star Talk. This is our first man edition, celebrating the life and the first steps on the moon of Neil Armstrong. We'll be right back. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this episode of Star Talk. We're 50 years past the first Apollo moon landing, but we never stuck around. We just kept going and leaving like a great romantic relationship. 
Curiosity Stream's Return to the Moon tells the story of how we're going back to the moon, and this time, how we'll stay for good. Learn about how helium-3 from the moon can power the Earth for years to come, and how the future of lunar colonies will look from conception to completion. This Curiosity Stream documentary made me want to go to the moon and listen to a little Pink Floyd. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Subscribe to Curiosity Stream to watch it now. It's just $2.99 per month. And for Star Talk fans, the first 31 days are completely free when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash StarTalk and use promo code StarTalk. You'll get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series with Curiosity Stream. Sign up now. We're back on Star Talk, First Man Edition. Who's the first man? Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. Got our friend of Star Talk, Mike Massimino, he's been in space twice. One of them to repair my Hubble Space Telescope. I love you, man, for that. Thank you. you. You're you. welcome. <laughs> Chuck Nice, co-host Chuck. Yes, and I've been in space. I'm still in space. <laughs> still space. I'm still in space. <laughs> space out and in space, two different things, Chuck. Two different things. <laughs> um, I was asked back in 2009 to host, to MC the 40th anniversary of the Apollo landing. You know, right. 1969 plus 40 gets you to 2009. It was in the Air and Space Museum. Mike, you tell what I did in front. You told you just you moved. moonwalked. I, well, I had, you have to, yeah, we had was, every living moonwalker yeah. in the audience in you front said of me. Some interesting things I remember. I'm sorry, you want to talk the moon to moonwalking thing? No, no, said, I don't I'm, remember I'm thinking, what I said. I no, did. you said some. You said something about being the 40th. Uh, the that 40th I thought was anniversary. Yeah, yeah okay. and you were saying how 40 was an interesting number because. Oh, 50, you might not, you know, and we've lost so many of those guys yeah, between yeah. then and now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, wow. uh, and you did the moonwalk, which was I had, great. You know, I don't dance Wait a minute, in let's public. Let's go back to the 40, because that sounds a little, you know, provocative. Oh, I, no. So what I try to was, remember if this is when I said it. 40 is an interesting number because in many stories, they don't track it beyond 40. So 40 days and 40 nights. Correct. Yes. It's not 50 days yeah, and 50 nights, 40 right. days and 40 nights. Jesus got 39 lashes, not 40, because 40, that's like infinite. Right. You got to bring that in. Okay. You don't want to kill him. Right. You just want to hurt him. Oh, that's the one lash that would have did it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what else? So just the number 40 shows up, especially biblically. Yes. And, yeah, there you go. Okay. And, yeah. and it's a, so when you pass 40, it's like more time than historically people reckoned okay you sort of you know all one right. through 40 and then infinity beyond that and so beyond that it's like okay is it still there for us to remember or do we have to be reminded of it whereas if it's within 40 you can talk about it people are alive they right. were conscious they were adults they were so that makes sense that's two generations basically and yeah beyond two you're, generations you're stepping into the next you're generation stepping into the next yeah. generation yeah, yeah. and that makes perfect sense okay so i think that set the mood at the time that this was a really special night and at mm -hmm. the at that time you remember that. in yeah. this event afterwards uh star truck talk was in our first year and i said this is a target of opportunity for me to get a bunch of interviews and we can make a show out of this so i waited till the event was over and we had a reception and all of this and i got interviews with various key people in the space program at the time, as well as some old timers like Neil Armstrong. And he Ooh. never gives interviews. Yeah. Have you ever seen him interviewed on TV? No, no, that's one of the things he's known for is not, is not, not being a big talker. Here's why I think he granted me the interview. Because you moonwalked. <laughs> <laughs> I first met him when I was 14. Oh. On board the SS Canberra, en route from New York City to the coast of Northwest Africa Holy cow. to observe a total solar eclipse, the longest in the century. And he was one of the various sort of important people brought on board. Right. First, they would enjoy the eclipse, but right. also they were there for the rest of us to interact with. And this is 1973. And, and you're, you're 14? 14? He's 14. 14. Are you yeah. by yeah. yourself? Yeah, I'm by myself. I, you, I lied. I told did you I was stow 15. away? What did you do? Yeah, I was going to say, what were you? You stow away? Yes. What? Did your parents know you were going on <laughs> yes. this thing? They're like, wait. <laughs> my parents didn't even let me <laughs> take the subway back then by myself. Why does that suitcase you man have legs? <laughs> <laughs> like, you went on a cruise <laughs> with Neil Armstrong to see an eclipse when you were 15. I brought my I, telescope I, with me that I, I bought from I got to go to a ball game and I was excited. Dog walking money. I had my telescope. I had my camera. Wow. And awesome. There were 1,500 people. They they took off all the shuffleboard 
the, the lounge chairs, mm -hmm. and it was a forest of tripods on this. The whole That's ship was a cool. scientific floating vessel. Wow. And he was there, I, it's when I met Isaac nice Asimov, childhood. and various other sort of heroes, if you're a geek kid right. in the day. Wow. And, no, that, you so, and he was sitting, kid. you were, let's, you, you were a king geek, okay? <laughs> you were king of all geeks. Because, yeah, a geek kid is just like, I can't believe I just got this new trading card. You're like, I'm going to North Africa with Neil Armstrong. Like, <laughs> for the eclipse. Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. All right. Go ahead. So, he's sitting that's, alone that's at the bar. And mm. this is one year after the last mission to the moon, which is 1972. It's four years after he walked on the moon. And he's alone. I said, you know, Mr. Armstrong. And I had my my ship program with his picture and, right. and the thing. And I said, would you mind signing? Well, I don't know. What do you, uh, could you sign? I mm -hmm. think, and so he signs it. And yeah. and I just said, thank you. When I next saw him, I showed him that, mm -hmm. that I was on this vessel. Right. And I think he, I don't know, I don't want to project what he might be thinking, but I think he saw that I I became no, somebody. No, there's an yeah. instant connection. That's, you come yeah. to me all these years later yeah. Yeah. with a signed program right. from a ship I that you stowed that. away on <laughs> yeah. so that you could go to North Africa <laughs> right. and, and watch an eclipse. Right. That's pretty cool. I would have rather the story ended with him going, pull up a stool, kid. Yeah. <laughs> But that, but that's you like Scotch. That, that's what it takes, kids, to get a to get an interview with Neil Armstrong. <laughs> you, you know, you're not just gonna. Well, hey, I've got my press credentials, credentials yeah, here. No, no, no. that's wow. not working. So, and it wasn't. It was brief, but I, I have it. it was, and you'll see, he's not a. You know, he's smart and calm and measured. Yeah. And let's let's check it out. This, cool. this is my interview with Neil Armstrong. Brief though it was. Uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, commander of the. Apollo 11. Uh, how old were you 40 years ago today? Uh, I was 38.93. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I love it. And of the entire Apollo era, what's your most indelible memory? And it could, it could be your own walk, but if not, I'd just be curious. Most indelible memory was uh, approaching the moon and, and flying through the moon shadow so that the moon was eclipsing the sun and we could see the corona all around the moon. It was not circular, it was elliptical, which was a big surprise, I understand that. And then we could see the moon, the dark side of the moon, of course, illuminated by Earthlight. Uh, and we could see the craters and the valleys and the plains in a blue-gray, uh, three-dimensional view that was spectacular. Texture. The and, image had and, uh, uh, and remarkable, at, but uh, imperceptible to a camera, but the human eye was wonderful. And the last question: uh, wh Where do you think? What do you think NASA should do next? Uh, I'm supporter of the NASA plan, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm just needs more money, I suppose. Uh, but the the ideas are there. Yeah, I think the the uh, uh, the approach they're on is, is uh, a good one. I I, I like that. It's a very it's a very that's a very pilot right. the, the approach. Here. <laughs> <laughs> they're a little, a little below glide slope, but you know, they're, 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 they're going to get there. <laughs> All right, Neil Armstrong, thanks for those uh, three questions. Wow. Yeah, that's and pretty cool. That's you guys great. never interviewed, no. and I felt like I was even taking too much by asking just those three questions. Yeah. And, yeah, and I'm, he, see, I'm kind of giddy. He, he was I'm, really into that second, what's the indelible, you could actually, yeah. I can almost feel him, him looking, looking see, experiencing at the, it. Yes. Experiencing like it, it was really, you know, very visceral, though, right. his, his recounting. And, and consider that's nothing you're gonna get on this side of the moon, yeah. right? So right. it had to be the backside, because right. he studied, he would have studied all the yeah. maps and the pictures and everything. Right, yeah. And yeah. you know, one of the one of the things that, uh, with, that I noticed with the movie, that I like, my, one of my favorite first man, scenes, yeah. First Man movie, um, was that you were able to see what it looked like. And I think they probably did it pretty accurately because the film that we had back then in 1969, we had some, but especially the approach and the landing, if you, they're like there were cameras kind of looking out that triangular window and the dust kicks up, but you really don't get an appreciation for what it was like to see outside. Can mm. you imagine now if we were able to do that with a bunch of GoPros or whatever they would stick on high-def cameras, we would see that, that moonscape and probably even the night passes. It'd be a, a GoPro describe. every foot. Probably Mounted so, and, right? You know, and, and make the whole, be, it's easy, right? <laughs> make the whole ship out of go. Probably do that. And now, and even in the low light level on the other side, I'm yeah. sure they could have found something. You know, they would have been able to do something. And because just recently, now we can get great 
uh, images of the of the planet at night from from station, for example. And, and if it wasn't so clear, his, his point that the eye catches it, but the camera doesn't, yeah. is because the eye in one glimpse can get a very high dynamic range. Of, yeah. So the moon can be very dim, but the solar corona can be very bright, right. and you can yeah. see all that at once. Where the camera is going to commit to either the bright corona or the dim thing, right. but you're not going to get both. Right. And he's experiencing both. And that description he gave you uh, allowed us to picture what it was like. And there's no, I, I, there's no real good video of that, but right. his description of it is mm -hmm. is what yeah, we have to go so with. It's so cool, like yeah. But but cool. you can feel that this he he'd rather just not be be interviewed. Right, it's he just want to go on his way. Yeah, and but is that really the best person to have uh, represent the fact that you have walked on the surface of a celestial body? That's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've heard one of his. I heard Mike Collins at at Neil's memorial. Mike Collins, the third astronaut who didn't get to go down right. to the moon. He was, he was, yeah, he orbited uh, in lunar orbit uh, in the command module while Neil and and uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin were on the on the on the moon. Um, I heard him uh, speak at the memorial. I don't want to misquote him, but at at, Neil's uh, who, at Neil Armstrong's memorial when he died, and and they had a memorial service for him at the Johnson Space Center, and he talked a little bit about that about you know him being maybe you know uh, shy and cerebral or whatever. But he was like, well, who would you? Why wouldn't you want that? Why would you this this man who was so qualified who did such a great job? Why would you want him to be anything different than who he was? And I think that's I think that that's he was the right man to land on the moon. And I think that was what they were most concerned with, because no kidding, they weren't so sure they were coming back from that mission. They weren't sure so sure they were going to be successful. Apollo 12 and 13, 11, 12 and 13 all had the same mission. They all trained for the same mission because they weren't so sure 11 was going to be successful. And then it was. And then 12 had to come up with something quick, which was different mm. than what they did on 11. But they all trained for that same mission because they weren't so sure 11 was going to be was going to be successful. What you're Neil, saying is if 11 failed, then 12 next, next up, it. you okay. try it. Right. You're next. Wow. Right. And if 12 that failed, didn't work, you're 13 next. was going to try it. Wow. And that can be in a, diff a few different ways. One, then not so that they would get that they wouldn't come back alive, but they might not get down to the surface and come back. They right. would have to abort mm -hmm. and then come back to Earth. So the it was really important for them to, to try to get the right guy to be the first guy. And, they, and, and that's what they went with. Who's the best guy to pull off the landing, especially, <laughs> of, of this? And, and that's where he had ice in his veins. And, and by the way, there's a, there's a misconception, I think, about... The first comments from Houston after he says, Houston Tranquility Base here, Eagle has landed. Yep. Okay. Which means, of course, the first word of the first comments from the moon is Houston. But there you go. <laughs> And a plug for, a plug for plug Houston, Houston, Texas, my yeah. former home. The planet Houston. Yep. So, Houston. Tranquility Base yep, here. That's Eagle the way we has talk. Yep. Actually, there was some other com the contact light and other things. Yeah, contact. Yeah, right. But, right. but Houston then says, Something like congratulations, you have a bunch of guys down here who were who were about to turn blue. Yeah, that was okay. Charlie Duke. Okay. Yep. You think they're saying that because they just landed on the moon? That's not why they're saying it. They were holding their breath. That's not. Yes, they were holding their breath, but it's not because they just landed on the moon. That's oh, not why. Okay. Why would? They, well, okay. So why were they about to turn? Wait. They were Smurfs. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had because to. Neil was not happy with the original landing spot. And he only has a certain yep. amount of fuel to prevent himself from crashing down onto the moon. This is keeping them buoyant. Yep. Nope, too many boulders there. Nope, too many boulders there. And you see that you see the fuel so, come down. Wait a minute. And then he keeps going, oh, I think I'll go over there. And my boy is smooth. Yep. It's like he's looking for parking in Midtown. <laughs> he's looking for he can't park there. He can't, yeah. oh, I can't park there. <laughs> right, baby, right. baby, you think I can fit in there? No, no, no. Let's, try, try over there. Try over there. <laughs> but if you don't make it, you got to go home. He wait, 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 wait. Go ahead. So then he finally finds a spot. Lance, there's like 1% or 2% fuel left. Yep. That's what they, because if he got, if he went to zero, because if, if, if he lands with fuel in a place that he could crash because it's not level, that's bad. Can't if he home. keeps looking, you can't get home. If he keeps looking and runs out of fuel, he'll crash because he runs out of fuel. Well, he might have aborted. Oh, they could have still aborted. I, 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 yeah, I there's don't a think you just, yeah. you just jettisoned yeah. at yeah. that point. Uh, no, I think that's what forgot they about that. Done. Right. Forgot about yeah. that. Okay. Uh, so, Which is not a good deal either. So he, with just, uh, and they, they capture this in the film and the tension. So that's why everyone at Mission Control was freaking out. Oh. Because that's, that's, the mission might not complete 
not because, oh, we're happy you landed. Yes, we're all happy landed on the moon, yeah. right. but we're happy you landed That's on the moon right. alive. Yep. Yeah, he was down right. to one. They had a low low fuel light came on, 30-second fuel or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, wow. in the cadence of, uh, which is depicted in the in the movie, but the cadence of uh, what, what you know, the calls he was getting from Buzz, you know, uh, so many forward, so many down. And I right. think he was talking about rates at that yeah, point. Yeah, it's right. It's rate this down, way and down. Right. right. Forward, so. yeah, five forward to, to give him an idea of how fast he was moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. So, because he's all out the window, I would think at that point. And, and that's, yeah. that's the cadence of him coming down there. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So, so I got to agree, if your mission is to succeed, Mm -hmm. That has higher priority over any social profile yeah, the or, person or, is going to have. Or public relations. Right. Yeah, did, did yeah. you succeed first and yeah. worry about the rest of that later. Right. And his yeah. Yeah. his friends, his colleagues have had John Young was still an astronaut when I became an astronaut and later walked on the moon. Alan Bean was his office mate and his colleague as well, another moonwalker. And I've heard him and those other guys say Neil was the right guy for the job. If they had a pick out of who they knew was going to get that job done, yeah. it was Neil Armstrong. Yeah. All right, we're going to take our next break. We're talking about first man. That's the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, when Star Talk returns. This episode of Star Talk is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. We're back, Star Talk, first man edition. We're celebrating the life of Neil Armstrong and the moon landing and his first steps. Got Mike Massimino, Mike. N Neil. Very good. Uh -huh. uh, you, I, I'm just still laughing, chuckling at your first tweet. Oh boy. What was it? Yeah. Golly, I'm in space. Was that uh, what it was? <laughs> launch was awesome. <laughs> launch was awesome. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Maybe have thought they more misunderstood about it, and but... thought you meant lunch was awesome. <laughs> no, that was that uh, was the first day in space. No lunch yet. Oh. You're not feeling that, that great. Yeah, lunch was awesome the next day. That's when I wrote about the macaroni and cheese. This first day was lunch. So at NASA, there's a famous colorful character called Gene Kranz. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who is portrayed famously in the film Apollo 13, saying what? Failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. I bumped into Did him. Did he say that in real life? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Cool. Well, that's the legend. Okay, cool. Okay. And I, I bumped into him uh, with a microphone in tow, first year of Star Talk. I'm getting all the interviews from all these space folks at this celebration of NASA's 40th anniversary for landing on the moon right. in, in 2009. Uh, let's pick up with my conversation with Gene Kranz. Here with Gene Kranz. Failure is not an option, Gene Kranz. That's your middle name now. That's uh, that's been a, uh, a a good game plan for most of my life. I uh, I really uh, came into the failure as not an option. Well, after I started uh, the business of Stars and Stripes Forever, when I was uh, going through uh, flight training, I had a very bad night. Uh, my first night solo, I suffered almost disabling vertigo. And uh, finally got back landed, and the next evening you got to go out and do it again. And there's a uh, story about you got to ride the horse that threw you. Well, I was fortunate that uh, as I was sweating it out, chain smoking, lucky strikes, the flight line public address system came alive, checking it out for the Saturday parade, and they played the Stars and Stripes Forever. I picked up my parachute, aced that night flight. In fact, I aced the business as a cadet graduated, went to fighter weapons school, and from that day on, every day of my professional life started with the Stars and Stripes Forever. There's a it's inspiring, everybody's got something that gets them going. For most people, it's a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, I, I, I start off with a cup of coffee, too. But the, uh, the Stars and Stripes, it was, it was interesting. I, I look for something that very slowly builds the energy, builds the crescendo, such that when you hit each day's work, you're at the peak performance and you remain there throughout the day. I, I found out that basically from my standpoint, psyching yourself up is the key to success. Believing that you can, believing that you will. And then when you fall down, believing that you can pick yourself up and start all over again. I want to ask you three questions. Okay. You ready? How old were you 40 years ago today? <laughs> I was uh, uh, 36 years old. You were a baby. I was a baby. My teams in mission control averaged age 26. Uh, the majority of those were kids fresh out of college. They had a couple of years training. They grew up in the Gemini program, early Apollo. They lived through the disastrous Apollo 1 fire, and they became tough and competent, and that was the fuel, the energy for the fire that took us to the moon. What is your most indelible memory from the entire Apollo era? Neil, I, 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 
I would say the most indelible thing were really many things. They were the personalities of the people. I had young kids that came in fresh out of college who had this dream of space. I had the engineers come in who developed the initial trajectory work, John Llewellyn and Carl Huss and Tequan Roberts, who were absolute pure mathematicians and they reveled, they, they, I mean, this, this world. So most people just... life to them. And, and basically, I was a dumb engineer. I was a, I was, I was a dinosaur. But my business was not to know the work that they did to the level they did it. My job was to be able to ask the right questions and watch the clock. I counted cadence for mission control. So most people who only see the astronauts have no concept that, of all this that's going on behind the scenes that's making it happen in the first place. Well, the, uh, the mission control team has the responsibilities for planning, training and, training, and operate. And when we have problems during the course of the mission, we have to come up with solutions that allow you to continue with the plan that you had. And if that is not possible, to come up with another plan that is just about as good. One last question. What's the primary goal you think NASA should have going forward? I believe NASA should go back to the moon and then on to Mars. I, I believe that it's very important. You know, to, to me, the moon is like uh, the, the boundary in the Mississippi River. We've been across there a few times. But really think about the development that took place out west. Think about Lewis and Clark going out to the Pacific. Think about the business of exploration and those things that we learned and developed and discovered out there. But most importantly, I think it is a human thing. Exploration is a process that must be in every person's mind. It has to be part of their personality. It has to be the kind of thing that makes them want to get up and go to work each day and discover. So, uh, back to the moon, onto Mars, and beyond. That's right. You got it. I'm go for it. Go for launch. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Excellent. There's uh, only one Gene Kranz. I yep. effing love that guy. <laughs> you love I him. love him. You want that to be the voice in Houston when I, you were in the universe somewhere. I want that to be the voice of everything. <laughs> Well, you, that guy is Gene, amazing. Will we be okay? Yeah. You will be fine. I'll tell you what you're going to be. You're going to be absolutely terrific. <laughs> That's what you're going to be. Neil, I want to tell you. I like coffee. I like my coffee as black as space. <laughs> but I use the stars and stripes as the sugar in my coffee. And I wake up every morning to coffee and stars and stripes. It's tremendous. That's America. <laughs> that's, that's, that guy <laughs> is awesome. <laughs> that dude is awesome. He's, he's he's really the guy that you want looking out after your ass. Really, is what yeah, it right, is. Right, and, right, I mean, right. when you're when you're up there in space, you want to know that you're the man in charge uh, is going to make sure you're okay and is going to is going to. Consider it most. Well, he didn't mean God in that case. The man in uh, charge. He meant Gene Kranz. I meant Gene <laughs> Kranz. No, the man in charge. What I really mean is a flight director. Right. The flight, flight director, director yeah. is is the person who oversees the team that is looking out for you. And you and, and that's what I always felt. You have a certain um, a, a certain uh, connection with the, your launch flight director. In this case, I think Gene was the launch flight director mm -hmm. for. Uh, and the, the guy, Mike Linebeck was a guy that launched us out of KSC, and then our launch flight director, my, my second mission, Norm Knight and so Tony Sakachi was our the guy during the orbit and there was those they they I think we had followed, an orbit guy we had an orbit guy there was an orbit guy for Apollo 11 as well right yeah, but yeah but yeah. but they all followed I think in Gene's steps and wow. uh and that was and that was what you wanted you wanted someone that was so the right stuff make sure you were coming back the right stuff wasn't only the folks who flew it's the no. folks on the ground yeah. yes and they yeah, take yeah. it just as yeah. personal when something yeah. happens right, as right. as anyone else involved and they're they're their their job is to bring you back Mm -hmm. More than anything. Now and I know where a, that saying comes from. You want a too. guy like that? What's that? What? Now I know where that saying comes from. What's that? Failure is not, not an option. option. Yeah, yeah, you hear people is. say that yeah. all the time. Right. Yeah. Thought, you didn't I know it was Gene Kranz? I, I, was was, I didn't. I thought it was like a movie quote. That, well, I didn't yeah, know it's a movie quote because him. it's quoting him. Oh, it's, nice. a, it's a title of his book, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not oh, option. man, that is You got to go get this book. I, I'm going to go get him. Are you kidding me? <laughs> get it on audio book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hope he, I hope oh, he narrates it. God. Chuck is like, his eyes are popping out yeah, of his head. Really, yeah. I love Chuck that guy. Like, <clears throat> this dude, he's like 76 right there so when you're talking around. to him. He's and, and even at 76 and you're talking to this guy, he sounds like a 22-year-old kid. Right, yeah. with excitement. Yes. And, right, right, I right. love that. Mike, did they level with you what your risk of not coming back was? Because they made a point of this in First Man that these risks are real. Mm -hmm. And we saw others die. Apollo 1, three astronauts died mm -hmm. on Earth. Wow. 
There are test pilots who have died. Mm -hmm. So th this is a specter over your choice to mm -hmm. participate. Uh, uh, yeah, I think they tried to be as accurate as they could and honest. about it. Yeah, and I remember it more because uh, I was I flew on Columbia as as a, the mission right before we lost Columbia, and then I flew uh, again after on on Atlantis, uh, both shuttle flights, and I don't remember if it, what the there wasn't as much talk beforehand. I guess it wasn't maybe as much on our mind as it was after the accident. We lived through that after the but Columbia accident. after Columbia accident. But the number I remember being told was about one out of seventy five chance. And they weren't saying we want you to know this number. It was more like this is our new calculated probabilities. Uh, I was thought it was one like one in seven, fifty. Well, I, I think the, there was one out of seventy-five, and that was total destruction. That's that's loss of crew and vehicle. That's everyone's dead, and the vehicle can't be used again. There are other odds that that may be of of. They folded the better. odds of reusing the vehicle with the odds of you coming back alive. Yeah, well, that sounds pretty. Yeah, crass. It's, it's but it's it's but it's true. I mean. I hate to put it that way, but when we lost when we lost Columbia, we just didn't lose our seven friends. We also lost the spaceship, and what happens to the program? So right. okay. there's a loss of crew and vehicle. Now losing, but but it's not so much about it. Really, isn't crass? I don't think because you can lose the vehicle but save the crew. So if you have an abort right. with the shuttle and it ends up in the water as you abort, hopefully the crew gets out alive. So mm -hmm. it's a combination of loss of crew and vehicle it was about one out of seventy five. And as it turned out, we had two accidents. At 135 flights, that's one. That's 50. probably how they came up with that number, quite honestly. But uh, right. but it was one out of 75 one of total loss. And do you think about it at all when you're, or are you just too busy doing your appointed duties to even let it cross your mind? You know, it, I, I I took a flight back to New York from Detroit yesterday morning, and the whole time I was like, God, I just hope these people know what they're doing. <laughs> um. <laughs> Sometimes you're worried more on a commercial flight than you are doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> At least we had a, we, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I did. I don't know if everyone does, but I, I knew that, uh, that there was a very good chance that something might, might, it might, you might not be coming back. Wow. And, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, in some ways, that's a, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> and the movie you, captured this I, I, yeah. poignantly with his relationship with his wife and his kids. Yeah. And, and I think they also showed the after it was successful. How wonderful it was for to have the that we had succeeded. Yes, that we had yes. succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Alan Bean tells us the story uh, that after his after after Apollo Eleven and after his mission, it wasn't uh, it, the whole world. His his impression was the whole world. It wasn't like you did it or the U.S. did it, but we did it. We the and, human and that, human that, species did. That, it. Yeah, that yeah. motto they came for all humankind. Let's change it a little bit, right? right. For all humankind. Uh, I think that's the way we everybody come in felt. Peace we come all, in peace for all human kind. Yeah, yeah right. and, and that's the way I think people felt about it. It was a, an accomplishment that for that humans m that showed what we could do, and the whole world was was a part of it. And they felt it was a, an accomplishment for the world. I was had the privilege and honor to be invited to Neil Armstrong's funeral mm -hmm. service in in Ohio after he died, mm -hmm. and the they had r the remaining sort of moonwalkers were there yeah. and. The moment was solemn, of course, but it was also celebratory. Mm -hmm. uh, there were reflections on Neil as a person. And one thing that came across, and let me we're running out of time, let me sort of end on these thoughts, if mm -hmm. I may, was, yeah, Neil was the right guy for this job. And because if he started grandstanding this achievement, then it would be like, he landed on the moon, but in fact, we all landed on the moon. It's our collective first step on the moon. Tens of thousands of engineers and scientists and hundreds of millions of taxpayers. We landed on the moon. And what did he do when he was done? He became Citizen Armstrong again. Became a professor. Went back to Ohio, where so many astronauts have come. Became a professor to, and shunned interviews. And I'm reminded it was a <clears throat> Roman, Roman emperor, Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus, after whom Cincinnati is named. Cincinnati, Ohio. That's what he taught. He He came to become emperor, and when he was done, he went back home and continued as a farmer. Didn't exploit the fact that he ran 
all of Rome. He didn't grandstand that fact. He was called into service. He gave of himself, his time, his energy, sacrificed whatever was necessary for his home life. When he was done, he went home. That's what Neil Armstrong did. He came home to us all. It's pretty cool, man, I have to say. Uh, I understand it for Neil Armstrong. Cincinnatus, got a problem with him. <laughs> what? What's your problem with Cincinnati? I'm just saying, you know, you were ruling all of Rome and then you became a farmer. What's your problem, buddy? Are you kidding me? The Roman Empire? You want a Roman Empire at your disposal? It's a and reminder. You go back to farming? It's a reminder that <clears throat> some people want power for power's sake yeah, rather yeah. than power to lead and guide others in a time of need. We got to end it on that. Mike Massimino, hey, thank you. always great and to thanks, have you, man. And thanks for doing this for Neil. Uh, I think for Neil Armstrong, he is, uh, I think the things you said, especially at the end there, I think those are, those are lessons we can learn for all of us, no matter what your occupation is, how to right. approach things. And uh, he was my hero as a little boy because he landed on the moon, but getting to know him a little bit as a person and learning more about him, that's when you realize what a true hero he was. So thanks for doing this and having right. me a part of it. And Chuck, it, Gene Crantz is hero now. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just so happy for Not this show. Not the Cincinnati show. guy. No. Yeah. Cincinnati. Cincinnati, no. Cincinnati, no. Gene Crantz yes. forever. There you go. That is all I'm saying. <laughs> this has been Star Talk. Uh, <laughs> most of you are listening. Some of you are watching. Uh, I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson. As always, keep looking up. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this episode of Star Talk. If you're watching this Neil Armstrong episode of Star Talk, you're probably a fan of the Apollo mission and space travel. Curiosity Stream has over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for you to enjoy, many of which will be right up your alley. It's just $2.99 per month. And if you go to curiositystream.com slash Star Talk and use promo code Star Talk, your first 31 days are free. As I told you earlier, you should check out Return to the Moon to see how we might get back to the moon for good. That sounds like a threat. Also, you'll want to check out the series on space probes, their video about the first captured photograph of a black hole, and Stephen Hawking's multiple award-winning shows. All of that is just $2.99 per month. Get it at CuriosityStream slash StarTalk and use promo code StarTalk for your first month free.